All right. All right. So now it's time for our featured speaker. And we have a tradition here at the GNA and, and Sharon, I don't know if you know what our tradition is. Chelsea already knows. Look at look at look at the, the family the, the therapist here. She's like, yeah, you gotta get out of here. We sent our featured speaker all the way to the back, Sharon. And you know why we do that? Is this for an app or on your phone? Well, the real reason why we do we do that because we want you to make that grand Entry. that grand Intro. We have to do the intro. We get so excited with this send you to the back thing that we forget the intro, but I don't. Okay, so today's featured speaker is Sharon Darrow. She is an author and the owner of Travel ID Cards. And her presentation topic today is going to be turning your dreams into print. So at this month's Sacramento, whoops. Hold on one second here. I just lost my screen. <laughs> Give me one second here. That's what I hate about these smartphones. I should print this out. Here we go. At this month's segment, oh, I lost it again. <laughs> this new Facebook app here is really sensitive. If you like scroll on it and you tap on it, it just goes off to the different screen there. So let me just get back here. Okay, at this month's Sacramento GNA meeting, Sharon will be sharing her secrets with us on how to take a dream and put it into writing, which will allow people to learn more of who you are and further your success. Sharon Darrow is an author that has written an amazing book, and I'm going to read the old title because I'm going to have you mention what the new title is. Old title is, And the Good Lord Remains Anonymous. She is also the owner of Travel ID Cards that produces and markets kids' travel cards teen travel cards, adult info cards, and pet travel cards, as well as additional specialized ID cards. Her company also creates custom ID cards for employers, organizations, sports teams, and for events. Sharon's products help you meet photo ID requirements for travel while increasing your security and peace of mind, which is the most important thing. Right, Sharon? That's right. So without further ado, I'd like to please stand up and rise to your feet. Please stand up and rise to your feet and give a big warm cheer and welcome to Sharon! Come on! There you go. Thank you. Sorry about the malfunction of the smartphone. Oh, okay. that's all right. They're not so smart. Oh, They're one more thing before you go. Yes. We did interview you on our new uh, talk radio show. How many of you have heard of our new GNA uh, uh, Member Spotlight show? Okay. Mm -hmm. We collaborated forces with Troy Brewer, CEO and founder of the Stutter County Network, and we have a radio station on the internet where we broadcast these shows. And this week through Sunday, Sharon's interview is going to be on at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 9 p.m. And you've got to hear this. She's going to probably mention a little bit of it here, but if you want more in depth, listen to the show. She's lived in the Sacramento area most of her life, and this lady knows how it was and how it is here. So, Sharon, it's all yours. I'm done. Thank you very, very much. This is a great group. But I have to say, there's also somebody special in here I'm going to let you know about. You talk about living in Sacramento most of my life. The lovely lady in the back corner there, the printer who said she's been doing it forever, she's fantastic. She's also my mom. Yeah. Aww. So, Aww. And it makes me really happy because I wouldn't be as outgoing and, and as successful as I am if it wasn't for the terrific model and genes that I got from her. All so right. I have to promote her. Lately, I have met so many people that say, oh, you've written a book. Well, I've got a book, or I've got a story I want to share, or I know somebody that wants to uh, write a book. Well, this is a great time. But it's also a really scary time because the industry is changing so rapidly that an author or a potential author can really get themselves in a lot of trouble. So I was going to kind of talk about my history of the writing as I've run into a lot of the pitfalls. And then if I could help you in any way, I'd be delighted to do so. I wrote the first time in 2006, and it was just the idea of helping out with some specialized knowledge that I have. Believe it or not, over more than 20 years, I bottle fed 511 kittens. That's a lot of kittens. And my specialty was the tiny ones that were maybe a couple of hours old. 
So I learned so much doing that. Sleep deprivation got to me after a few years and I had to stop. But the knowledge that I gained really was important for the rescue groups. So I decided to put it all down, since I was still working with rescue groups, and I turned it into a book. I had no idea what I was doing. I just wrote down what I did and had my friends read it. And they liked it, so and I didn't know how to publish it. It was a little niche book, you know, there's not that many people doing that. So I found a company online called Lulu.com. At that point, you didn't really have much in the way of rules. You just uploaded it and they started selling. Well, it's actually done very well. It's now used as a training manual for rescue groups all over the whole country, which is really good. I'm very excited about it. But I really didn't know what I was doing. And when I did my second book in 2013, I went back and, and was reading my Bottle Cats program. I'm like, oh my God. And I didn't do this right and I didn't do that right. And it worked out okay. But it was so clearly done by a novice that didn't know what she was doing. And you don't want to embarrass yourself. <laughs> Your book will do well. But there's, you, you know, if, if it reads poorly, if it isn't properly laid out, you know, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's so important that you, there's certain things you need to do to get help. So I redid it in 2013 and had updated version, and I'm really happy it actually won an award. It's the Northern California Publishers and Authors, so I take a lot of pride in that. But it looks a lot better now. I didn't know much back then. But you can, and I'll just pass this around for everybody wants to take a look. But then I got an idea in 2012. I've been able to have a lot of life experiences, like most of you, I'm sure. And there's things that um, really help you. And there's also poor little things you go through. And maybe years down the line, you look back and think, as awful as that was, I learned something. I really did. And I don't believe there's accidents in life. I think every person that comes into your life, every experience, everything you do, there's some little guidance there. And it happens to us because it's supposed to. And we learn something from it. And in networking and different things, and I guess I should tell you that prior to 2008, I was a hermit. I like people or animals better than people, and I just never get out in a group. But when we closed the family business, and I had to start my own with a product, because who was going to employ a 60-year-old at the start of the 2008 recession? No way. I had to get out. And I discovered it was fun. And I discovered my mother's wonderful ability with people. I got a little of it, so I was really excited. And I started sharing networking, and I'd share some of the stories that illustrated life lessons. And I decided in 2012 that I wanted to write a book, including a lot of these stories, and illustrating how life is not accidental. And maybe the stories I tell would resonate with others, and they could learn more about themselves and maybe feel good about the things that they've experienced. So I started, and my husband said, wait a minute, you're running a business, you're the president of the National Association of Professional Women, you're still doing rescue, I have to make an appointment to even talk to you, you're not doing one more product or one more project unless you give something up. He was right. 48 years, and that guy still expects a little personal time, you know? <laughs> I don't know, but he's, he's a great guy, really. So I decided to give up the NAPW and write my book, and I gave myself 90 days to do it. That doesn't sound very smart, does it? I didn't make the 90 days, but I got it written in 120. I wrote it. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. But when I was telling my group, the NAPW, that what I was doing, uh, that I was giving up the presidency to write the book. And uh, Sue, who happens, happens to be an editor, she said, well, Sharon, how's that book going? And I said, well, actually not very well. I've got 57 pages, but I keep going back over those. I can't seem to get them perfect to move on. And she laughed at me. She said, Sharon, that's what your editor's supposed to do. Right. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know anything. <laughs> and I cannot overemphasize the importance of an editor. You can go on and people will tell you, oh man, you can just upload a 
a book in to Kindle and Amazon or do this or whatever. I don't need anybody to review it. No, you don't. But do you want to look professional? Do you want it to be the best you can be? You've got to have a professional editor. And that is not your mom. <laughs> it is not the English teacher that lives three doors down. <clears throat> it's someone who's experienced as a book editor. You've got to do it. But anyway, I sat down with Sue, and she said, well, Sharon, I'll look at it, but there's two things an editor has to determine. Number one, do you have an idea we're sharing? Is it a story that anybody would be interested in? And she liked mine, so that was step number one. And then the second part, she says, is, are you a good writer? If you're not a good writer, don't let that stop you at all. It just means you need help, and someone can help you. They can ghostwrite, they can collaborate. There's many different ways that you can get that idea of yours into print, that birth that baby that you've got in your head that you want to get out. You just have to find the right assistance. Well, I gave her my first 57 pages, and then I waited. And I thought, man, she's completely forgotten me. It was two weeks before I got it back. Doesn't that sound silly? Get it very silly. I know. Usually it's months. Yes. But I was impatient. And she told me, she called me and said she'd gone through it and had sent it back. She says, and by the way, you're a very good writer. Well, I was patting myself on the back again really good until I got the envelope. And then I looked at it and thought, oh my God, it looked like a horrible English essay. I mean, it was just written all over. And I thought, I'm a good writer? What in the heck would it look like if I was a bad writer? This is terrible. But that's a really important lesson because the editor, remember, is on your side. You can't take your ego out of it. Editor only has one purpose, and that's to make your book shine. And I discovered that I read, read like, or I write like I talk. I use certain phrases over and over. So very, really, certain words. And when I'm writing, I don't use contractions. I have everything written out. So it reads very awkwardly. <coughs> but it didn't matter. She corrected, got all the grammar fixed. And I tried at one point. Now I know what I'm doing wrong. I'll just write it right. You know what? The creative spigot just shut off. I can't do them both together. But the editor was wonderful. And we finished the book, and then I had, I had to come up with a title, and I decided, well, this is really good. I know what I'll do. I came up with the title, and the good Lord remains anonymous. And I figured I'll do it all in lower case, because that's a combination of two sayings. The first is, coincidences are just little miracles where God remains anonymous. I always like that. That's kind of cool. And the other one is the saying that comes from the Midwest. People would say, hey, are you going to come to that meeting? Or, or whatever, the family reunion? And the answer was, good Lord, willing in the creek, don't rise. Have you ever heard that? You know, I looked that up the other day on Google, and that's not what I thought it is. Do you know that actually came from a general who was asked to come to Washington, and he said, good Lord, willing in the creek, don't rise. But he was talking about creek Indians in an uprising. <laughs> Completely different than I, than I thought. But anyway, that was the time I came up with and put them together. And I thought, oh, this will be really pretty. I'll use a blue cover and clouds, and, and it'll be great. My editor liked it. My publisher liked it. Very poor idea. I shot myself in the foot big time. Because I didn't do my homework. You need to know, when you're doing your book, who's your audience? What are you writing about? Go look in the bookstore. Look at different covers and everything. I found out after we'd had the first run, because I went through a, a publisher, a local publisher I knew, this looks like it belongs in a Christian bookstore. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's wonderful books there. But that's not what this book is. It's not a religious book. So people that maybe would pick it up, and some of the stories would make them uncomfortable. Somebody else that would like a particular story, maybe on the metaphysical side, wouldn't pick it up. So I lost a lot of my target audience because I didn't know that. You have to do your homework. Well, I still love the book, 
But then I got into a little to-do. Let's just say my publisher and I are divorced. That's the best way to put it. Back. When you're ready to publish your work, again, do your homework. Publishing is a very intimate relationship. And the old publishing houses don't work the way they used to. There are many different outlets. You really need to investigate what's out there and make sure you're in the right place. So since we had our divorce, but I still own my property, I decided to bring it back out with a cover that made more sense and a title that made more sense. And I went through Create Space. Now my book is called From Hindsight to Insight. Looking back at work, see? A traditional to metaphysical memoir. And exact same things inside, but I think it does a better job of representing what I have to share. And that's kind of the way I did it. And But this, I did a very different way, and it's something that's available to any writer. I went through Create Space. Do any of you know what Create Space is? It's part of Amazon, like everything else in the world. <laughs> but if you have a professional editor, and you can get a professional um, cover creator or not, this is a way to get your book out with very little expense. Because I had it edited, I actually used their templates for the covers. I didn't have to create anything. And the beauty of Create Space is that you can decide your distribution, the whole nine yards, and you will know exactly what the books cost you, whether you order one or do you order a thousand. The price is the same. Now, other ways you'll save money if you order a lot of them, but sometimes it's nice to always be able to prepare. I know what a book's going to cost me, period. So that worked out really well for me. And that one has been going well. But I had already decided I wanted another one out. <laughs> so I did. I brought it out last month. Mm -hmm. this, the animals are such an important part of my life, as you might have seen from all the rescue work I've done. For a long time, I wanted to tell the stories of a lot of the individual animals. So I wrote a book for that, called it Faces of Rescue, Cats, Kittens, and Great Names. Mm -hmm. I know it. We have <laughs> all, and they do great. But this I wanted to do something different too. I filled it with pictures of the cats, kittens, and great names in the stories. And my purpose for writing this, in part, was to market it through rescue groups. I can offer this to rescue groups at a greatly reduced price when they buy it online. They can sell it as educational because the stories will make you cry and laugh and you know they kind of touch everybody that goes through goes oh which is exactly what I want mm -hmm. but they can sell it to help people know what rescuing is like but also as a fundraiser so this is my way to help rescue groups after all the knowledge that I've got now this raises another question though of doing a book if you're going to put illustrations in your book and you have one color picture in your book, you're now going to pay about three times as much to have it printed, and it costs as if every page is colored. That's why most of the books you'll see now are in black and white pictures. Of course, if you go to your iPad or your computer or your Kindle Fire or Nook or whatever, then you see the color pictures. But the print one is black and white. I had a real internal dialogue, but the pictures of the animals really pop. And every picture in here is one I've taken over the last 20 years. I'm not a photographer, but they're pretty good pictures. And the thing was, did I want to do that or not? And I think that doing it in color makes them pop more. And it's worth it, but I have to make some decisions on distribution. This costs quite a bit more, but I think it would be more effective with the goal that I set of marketing it through rescue groups. Now, what I always tell people that are going to be writing or say, hey, I want to write this and do it, what's the first thing you need to do? Just write. Just sit down and write. Because the more you do, you're going to flesh out and organize in your mind what you want to accomplish. 
And then the next thing you want to do, maybe while your editor is going through your printed work, is a little homework. You need to understand what is your market. Who are you going to be putting it out to? The reason you need to do that is because unless your name is Hillary Clinton or Kim Kardashian or Ellen DeGeneres, no one's going to market it for you. You as the author are completely responsible for your marketing and your promoting. And one of the things they actually tell authors now before you get your book out there is you do your promoting before you write it. I didn't know that either. So I kind of hit the ground with a thud instead of running. And this is why they tell people, build your platform, which is great advice for any business person. Who do you know? Are you known in certain trade circles? I'm known in the rescue circles all over the country. So I have a platform for those. Didn't help the memoir a lot, but still I can build on that. But think about what your expertise is. Who do you know? Write a blog. Get the word out there so that when you're going to have it ready, you can have an expert help you do your launch and you will hit the ground running. Is there any questions so far? Don't have any questions? Mm -hmm. I must have done something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have written books already? Oh. I know Wade has. Articles. <laughs> okay. And Kyle, you have a book too, though, don't you? Mm -hmm. Don't oh, you have a book? Okay. Just working on it. Yes? Well, what's the name of that slide again? I'm sorry? Create. Well, the site? Create Space. Create Space. Create. And I, you know, I was a little hesitant because Amazon is sort of like a giant that eats everything in the world. But the person that turned me on to create space was a speaker at a local writers group called Northern California Publishers and Authors. And if you think of writing, it's a good idea to start getting to know other writers. It's a great group, and there's many in the local area. But have anybody heard of Alton Pryor? Alton is a writer. He's been writing for over 20 years. He specializes in things having to do with the American West, California, and his books are all historically based about stories and geography and things around here. One of his first books sold 180,000 copies, so he kind of knows what he's doing. And he's been at it so long, he's used a lot of traditional publishers and so forth, but he recommends CreateSpace because the printing cost is the lowest of any place, the quality is good, and he always knows what the, co the books are going to cost him. So I kind of figured that if you've got an expert like that, do it. But he also recommended, don't cut corners with create space. Never put a book up, doesn't have proper editing. Make sure your formatting's right. Get your cover well designed, and do homework on things like their title, and knowing who you're marketing to. And then you should do well, because people are reading. And the, the mix between digital and print, because a lot of people think, well, I'll just put it out in Kindle. That's great. And it is wonderful, but it's about 50 50. And there are distribution channels that will not consider you unless you also have in print. Have you found that? Oh, yes. It, it, they don't consider you credible if you don't also have it in print. And there are so many rules doing your homework. I reread my first one. Oh man, I was so embarrassed. The one thing, I like exclamation points, and I had a lot of them in that one. And my editor, every time she cross it up, she says, exclamation points are when you're yelling fire. Stop, and I put two or three of them. <laughs> I like exclamation points. And I would do that, and I didn't know it looked really bad. And when I went back and looked at the cover, I wanted to just cry. At the NCPA, I learned for the first time, you know how you can brand your book as amateurish immediately? Under the title, put your name, but right before it, put by. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, you don't put by. They assume it's by. It's your name down there. <laughs> but I didn't know that, so my first effort was by, you know, wrong. I didn't know. Did you guys realize that every chapter, the first page of every chapter, is on the right-hand side? And if it falls on the left, you have a blank page. 
first time around. I didn't know that. That's another little tip off. This person <laughs> doesn't know what they're doing. <laughs> but formatting is really important. You have to get that. One. But I learned. And yes, sorry, I didn't even no. I was curious about in your experience now. Uh, are, is it about 50-50 people going traditional, sending in queries? Or no, not anymore. It's way weighted towards ind the independent publishers. Independent and I'll tell you why. Traditional publishers have changed dramatically. First of all, a lot of them have disappeared. The few that are left, they are going to look at your work. But just as much, they're going to look at your platform. Do you bring followers? If you don't, forget it. If you don't bring them, say I have a blog with 10,000 followers and I have this and that, they're not going to market you. If you don't bring the followers, they're not going to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Also, traditional publishers no longer accept unsolicited manuscripts like they did years ago. We used to call it over the transom. <laughs> it was before I knew what I was doing, but I read that a long time ago. Now, they want an author or an agent to present it. But there's a little catch-22 with the agents. Unless you're published, they don't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do you do it if you're not published? <laughs> now, if again, if you have a huge following, a famous name, you're going to get the big publisher, and yes, you're going to be everywhere. And so, but for most people now, the independence is the way to go, as long as you're very, very careful. One of the things I like about independence, and one of the reasons I had a divorce, is because I want to control my work. Mm -hmm. The traditional publisher, they can change your title. They can cut parts of your book out. They can determine what the cover is. And if you really invested in it, you may not like that. Also, with traditional publishers, does anybody know how much your cut is at that uh, price in the store? Less than 10%. Yeah. Usually it's about 4 to 6, depending on your, your history and how much uh, experience you have. If you're buying a book for nine ninety five and your cut is six percent, that's not very much. Mm -hmm. No, but it's a lot. To me. It really isn't. And the other thing, when I was working my first round, my publisher paid for all the books. So when I took some to to events or whatever, I paid for them. And then you have to wait for the work. I kind of like. Controlling it. If I sell a book and get money, I can keep it now. I don't have to wait six months. I like that better. You know, that feels better to me. And if I go to a event and want to mark a price down, I don't have to ask for permission. I can do it. And if I want to give books to selected people, either because I love them or, be, or because I think they will really help for the marketing, maybe they'll do both, I don't want to have to get permission. I want to just be able to do it. And I know what it cost me. So I know the value that I'm passing on. But with a traditional publisher, you don't have those controls. And this is why. Now there are some really good hybrids that you kind of use a cafeteria thing and choose what you want from them. There are some local ones that are very, very good. And that will give you a little more control. What you need to avoid is going online and looking for a publisher. Because I'll tell you what's happening right now. There's quite a few publishers. Um, I think Author Solution is the big baddie that's owned by Penguin, and they own about five others uh, uh, in prints. And they will tell you, we are going to do you, you, we're going to market you, we're going to do everything, the whole nine yards. It's only going to cost you somewhere between three and five thousand dollars. And it's counting the ones you bought and gave to your relatives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's very few. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, on your cat, your bottle caps, uh -huh. um, can you also, are, are there, I didn't get to see if there was formulas, but does it work on other animals too, or, you know, like little puppies? No. Animals are the babies, all, ba well, certain things all babies need. They need warmth. They've got to have their, the proper formula and the proper timing. But this book is geared strictly for kittens. They're easier than puppies, I think. But I have to, the reason it wore me out after 20 years is if you get a newborn, you have to feed it and clean it every two hours around the clock. And I was still working 40 hours in the day. I was young when I started it. After a while, you were so worn out. 
and I couldn't keep it up anymore. So there it's been. But anyway, on those publishers, if, if the average author sells less than 100 and you spent five grand, that, you know, unless it just does your ego good to know your books out there, that's a, that's a big loss. In fact, nowadays, if your book sells a thousand copies, you're considered a really good success. This little book has sold uh, over 1,100 copies, and Lulu.com, which I leave it there because if I went someplace else, all the reviews I'd lose and I'd be starting fresh, so I'd keep it there. But for a narrow niche book to have sold that much is considered a real success. Lulu has over 80,000 copies, or titles, I'm sorry, and they're ranked based on how many ha they have sold. My ranking is just under 4,000 out of 80,000, and I've sold just under 1,100. What does that tell you how many most people sell? So don't put a fortune into putting a book out because you're not going to recoup it. Well, I guess J.D. Rawlings did, but that's not likely to do. You know, you're probably not going to be writing the next Harry Potter. We'd like to think that, but it really isn't very likely. So find a way that you can afford and put out the best quality you can and do all your homework. Does that help you? Yes. yes. Okay. Any other questions? Then I have to say, because I do have to do all my own marketing and promotion, that I have copies of all my books, and they are available. If you're interested, please let me know. And I'm also a public speaker on various subjects, so if you have a group or an event and you'd like me to speak, I would be thrilled. Thank you all very much. Be sure to pick up a clock. Louder! Woo! Thank you very much, Sharon. Okay.